Uh, good evening. I'm Glenn Morrow, and I will be your host this evening. And on behalf of Nova Bay Pharmaceutical, I would like to thank you for participating in this webinar. Nova Bay are introducing an exciting new product, Eyelid Cleanser. This product may just change the way you look at lid and lash care, as well as the way you treat the eye conditions that require a lid hygiene component. I would ask you to submit questions as the webinar proceeds. At the end of the formal session, we will have the chance to have our expert answer a few questions. Now I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers. Dr. Katie Najafi Tagal is an ophthalmologist practicing in Marin County in the Bay Area of California. She's a surgeon and glaucoma specialist. Katie was instrumental in the development of eyelid cleanser and has had more clinical experience with this product than anyone in the country. Art Epstein is an optometrist practicing in Phoenix, Arizona. He is held in high regard as a lecturer and considered one of the leading experts in conditions of the anterior segment, including blepharitis and dry eye. Now, without any further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Katie Najafi. Thank you, Glenn. Um, this is uh, Katie Najafi Tagal, and I have been uh, fortunate to participate in um, many of the clinical trials, and I'm um, actually the, uh, the official, um, my official role with Nova Bay Pharmaceutical Company has been uh, being a medical monitor for our global ophthalmic clinical trials. And I've also, um, again, been fortunate to be able to develop a, an innovative uh, new product called Eyelid Cleanser. Um, I'd like to pass the, the podium back to Art. Thank you, Katie. Uh, actually, all of you are quite familiar with some of the regulatory uh, requirements these days. So uh, as you can see, my disclosure slide, uh, I've been fortunate to uh, have uh, received support from a number of companies, uh, either in the form of honoraria, consulting fees, uh, or um, educational grants, uh, research grants, and the like. Uh, I'm particularly excited uh, about the topic today because it's one of the conditions that we see a tremendous amount of. In fact, uh, I just literally came from the office just a little while ago, uh, and sure enough, I saw a number of patients uh, who uh, had uh, significant blepharitis. Well, I think there's been greater interest in understanding the role lid flora plays in both health and disease. Certainly normal flora has an important role, uh, but when it gets out of control, it becomes a significant issue. Blepharitis is certainly the most common, the most visible, and one of the things that both optometrists and ophthalmologists deal with all the time. Uh, there's been tremendous interest in meibomian gland dysfunction, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that, uh, particularly as it relates to bacterial flora on the lids and lashes. Uh, we'll also uh, talk briefly about pre-op uh, uh, surgical prophylaxis, which is an increasingly important issue uh, with uh, increases in surgical volumes and uh, the the percentage of the population who are uh, surgical candidates. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about contact lenses and the, the role uh, of blepharitis and lit flora play in contact lenses and contact lens complications specifically. Well, uh, blepharitis is something, as I said uh, just a minute ago, is uh, a condition well known to everyone probably from the first year of optometry school or the first year of residency. Uh, it is either acute or it can be chronic in presentation. Uh, it involves the lids. Uh, I specifically think of blepharitis as what most people describe as anterior blepharitis, which uh, is often bacterial but can be uh, seborrheic uh, and uh, can also have other underlying causalities. Um, the location for blepharitis uh, is the anterior lid. I differentiate that from meibomian gland dysfunction, sometimes called posterior blepharitis, uh, because the two really are inherently different conditions. Uh, and sometimes we see a combination or a mixed form, which uh, has traditionally been called marginal blepharitis. And we'll talk a little bit about all of those conditions. Well, staph is uh, the most ubiquitous uh, organism that we see on the skin. And that's uh, certainly not different on the lids. Uh, staph uh, is a very aggressive little critter, and uh, it tends to stake out its own territory. Uh, it often creates inflammation by virtue of 
uh, exotoxins that it produces, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, particularly in terms of its role in meibomian gland dysfunction. About 12% of all patients that present in our offices have uh, staphylococcal blepharitis, uh, and we see it in two major age groups, so younger patients, uh, and uh, we also see it in the elderly population. In fact, our practice is heavily skewed towards the elderly, uh, and blepharitis is among the most common conditions that we see. It also has a predilection for uh, female patients, so blepharitis is uh, it's a very, very common finding. And as you can see from this classic photo of it, you can almost see the staph overpopulating the lids. You can see a little bit of uh, pus as well. There's clear uh, signs of infection here. Some of the lashes have been lost. Sometimes you'll see them truncated. Sometimes you'll see them just missing uh, with a significant amount of inflammation, not just on the lids themselves, but also uh, in the uh, in the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is impacted by uh, overpopulation of staph bacteria. Uh, Seborrheic blepharitis, on the other hand, uh, is again very, very recognizable. It occurs primarily in older patients. We see a lot of it is associated with a number of dermatologic conditions, uh, and uh, particularly uh, seborrhea. Uh, and there is no gender predilection. Uh, it can be extremely irritating to the patient, uh, particularly as some of the scurf ends up uh, within the tear film itself, causing a lot of irritation. Uh, and there is a relationship with aqueous deficient dry eye. It tends to be very destabilizing to uh, an otherwise normal tear film, so patients do often complain of dry eye signs and symptoms. Uh, and here you have a classic example of that. You can see the scurf all over the lashes. Uh, you can spot this literally from across the room. And this very much looks like the patient I saw just a little while ago, an elderly gentleman uh, who was complaining of dry eye symptoms and had a significant amount of, of blepharitis. Uh, well, um, when we look at blepharitis, you know, there is no classic case, but this is a very, very nice, I think, typical case. Uh, here we have relatively unaffected acuity. Most of the time the acuity is relatively normal pressures, uh, as you can see, 21, 23. Uh, blepharoconjunctivitis is very clear. Not only is there blepharitis, but the, the patient also has conjunctivitis, the classic degree on leaves and lashes. Uh, and uh, also has significant conjunctival hyperemia uh, for the reasons that we discussed before. There's a significant amount of debris that gets within the, uh, within the lashes, uh, and uh, that becomes a significant issue for, uh, for, the, uh, for the patient. Well, mybomian gland dysfunction is something that we talk about uh, a lot because it's ubiquitous. Uh, we see more and more uh, MGD than we've probably ever seen before because of increased awareness. Uh, recent work by LAMP suggests that uh, a little under 90% of all patients who have dry eye actually have uh, either dry eye caused specifically by meibomian gland dysfunction and lipid deficiency or it was contributed to their uh, dry eye. Uh, and uh, very often, MGD is associated with staph overpopulation. The staph play an interesting role in meibomian gland dysfunction. They tend to produce exotoxins. The staph tend to be very territorial, uh, and they try to uh, kill their neighbor to claim as much ground as they can by producing those exotoxins. When they get into the tear film, they destabilize the uh, the tears as well as produce a lot of inflammation, uh, often producing uh, these classic infiltrates that you can see in the upper picture. Uh, another thing that happens is staph tends to be uh, gluttonous, if you will, and the congealed, saturated mybome that occurs with MGB uh, tends to be an excellent food source for them. They secrete lipases intended to break down uh, that, uh, that lipid. Uh, and turn it into a food substance. And when that mixes with the salt and the tears, you end up with uh, saponification, and you see that as frothing. So many of these patients complain of burning, uh, which is so commonly associated with meibomian gland uh, dysfunction, and that's because of the saponification. So there's a lot of inflammation that's present because of this overpopulation of staph bacteria, which becomes a significant issue. So let's briefly talk a little bit about uh, surgical prophylaxis, which is a concern uh, when we look at uh, any surgical procedure. In refractive surgery in particular uh, is problematic, uh, and there are numerous reports that show significant risk of 
uh, of super infection or infection uh, post uh, PRK, post LASIK. Uh, and uh, in fact, I can recall a case quite distinctly that occurred at our LASIK center uh, when I lived back in New York. Uh, and as you can see, it can be a significant issue, and you have to be very cognizant of uh, pre existing flora on the lids and lashes before you consider uh, refractive surgery. You know, likewise, uh, with cataract surgery, endophthalmitis is always a fear. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I, I guess, hallmark study that was performed by Mark Speaker showed very clearly that there's a very, very close association between the flora that exists on the lids and lashes uh, and the organisms that ultimately produce endophthalmitis. So we have to be very cognizant of that. And I think uh, any surgeon, any co-manager is going to be very, very concerned about trying to achieve uh, as much of a reduction in flora as possible preoperatively. I think that's something that we're all concerned about, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, one of the more recent uh, areas of interest, uh, and an area of interest of, uh, of you know, like great significance for me, uh, are infiltrative events that we see in contact lens wearers, and that's been bandied about for years. Uh, it certainly has grown in interest, and I think grown in prevalence with the uh, appearance of silicone hydrogel lenses, although the reasons for that are not completely certain. However, recent work by uh, Loretta Schottka Flynn uh, made it very, very clear that a lot of these infiltrates seems to have a clear association uh, with overpopulation of lid flora. So there is a, a relationship again. So we have a clear cut evidence that uh, awareness of lid flora and control of lid flora is one of the most important things that we can attend to as clinicians. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Katie now, who's going to talk a little bit about this novel uh, new product, and I think you're going to find it quite interesting. Katie? Thank you, Art, for that wonderful uh, overview uh, uh, present presentation on uh, blepharitis and really uh, highlighting why it is so important to pay attention to patients' eyelids and um, one of the reasons really that I became interested in developing a, a different product from what was really available uh, over the counter for patients was that I'm a glaucoma specialist and I tend to see many patients who are elderly and many patients who have had recurrent episodes of blepharitis. And these are patients that come back every couple of months or every three months or they call in and they want another bottle of antibiotic, another bottle of Maxitrol or Tobradex. And in fact, I had one patient that, um, I don't know, someone's advancing for me. <laughs> um, I had one patient actually that um, I looked at his chart and I saw this gentleman 25 times in a period of four, four years. And he's actually the gentleman that is in the video that you, you may get a chance to take a look at. And, you know, he looked at me in one time and said, don't you have anything better to offer me? And I had given him pretty much every available antibiotic. He had been using uh, other um, over-the-counter um, eyelid uh, scrubs, Ocusoft, Sterilid, you know, other products that have been available. And he had actually had allergic reactions to them. And so I was searching, really searching for a better product, something that patients can use that uh, would be safe and effective. And so I'm really, really um, excited to be able to share this with you. Uh, we have a product called Nova Bay Eyelid Cleanser. It is saline with pure hypochlorous acid, 0.01% as preservative. It is considered a medical device and we have 510K clearance from FDA to use it. It is a prescription, which I think is superior to um, having over-the-counter products uh, being used by patients, and simply because, you know, you tell a patient to go buy something from the near pharmacy, and you don't really know exactly what they end up with. They may, you know, pick up the cheapest product on the market, and it's not what you wanted them to use. So if it's a prescription product, you have more control over exactly what they're going to be receiving. And this product, Novo Bay Eyelid Cleanser, is indicated for removal of foreign material including microorganisms uh, from the skin. One of the, you know, the, I think the topics that were presented earlier by Art today uh, just really highlighted the, the problem that we have with, uh, for instance, blepharitis. It is a very complex disease. It's multifactorial. And it tends to be a chronic problem, and patients uh, really need to have something that's safe, that's non-toxic, not, not irritating, 
And I think most experts agree that the mainstay of treatment for blepharitis is eyelid hygiene products. You know, you, you can't have someone be on chronic antibiotics. You're going to end up with uh, bacterial resistance. And I think we've seen that in many of our uh, studies um, with intravitreal injections where patients were being given antibiotics every uh, few months and we ended up with actually creating resistant bacteria. So we want something that's non-toxic, not something that doesn't generate resistance. We certainly would like to see uh, activities in other areas such as um, uh, activity against biofilm. I think uh, many of patients with blepharitis have really a dermonecrotic process and uh, biofilm, as um, many experts agree, is present when we have a chronic infection or chronic wound. And I think a product that has anti-biofilm activity would be superior in helping, you know, get rid of those uh, recurrences or chronic infection. And certainly, as uh, Art pointed out, bacteria produce toxins. And if we have something that can actually have an antitoxin effect, again, would be superior. So the Nova Bay Eyelid Cleanser, I think, really uh, sort of addresses many of these issues uh, in a safe uh, fashion. It, and by removing the bacteria, by mechanical debridement, and hopefully uh, removing the biofilm that really houses uh, the bacteria, we can perhaps get a hold and uh, get a hold over the, the chronic blepharitis that many patients uh, face. Uh, Nova Bay um, has actually three different products with the same type of chemistry. The first one is called Nutraphase. It is a wound care product, and uh, it is also based on hypochlorous acid uh, solution with saline. And then we have the Advanced Eyelid Cleanser, which is indicated for use around the um, skin of the eyelids, and it's an eyelid hygiene product. And our third product is Salarex, which is uh, currently being used for uh, post-laser resurfacing. Uh, we have indication to use um, this product and also the neutral phase for uh, burns, uh, second and third degree burns for patients with non-healing wounds, vascular insufficiency, ulcers. And in fact, uh, we've had tremendous success in helping patients with necrotizing fasciitis and flesh-eating bacteria, along with use of debridement and IV antibiotics. What I'd like to share with you is also a video that really kind of highlights uh, the chemistry behind uh, these products. And uh, this is what you're looking at is a neutrophil that is chasing a microbe. And in just a few seconds, that neutrophil is actually uh, going to capture the microbe and um, you'll see what happens. But really what we're trying to tap into here is the chemistry behind what is released during a neutrophil engulfment of a microbe, which you're seeing right now, and the oxidative burst that happens. So the red um, that you're seeing on the, on the video is actually the... Uh, reactive oxygen species that are produced as a neutrophil engulfs a microbe. Hypochlorous acid is actually one of those molecules that's released. And I think what's been ingenious with what we've been achieved, what we've been able to achieve at um, Novo Bay is that the chemists at Novo Bay have been um, able to actually uh, really put that the, the red material that you see on the on the slide in a bottle and, um, and be able to have it be stable for, for uh, over two years. And, uh, and the patients are able to actually use it in a safe manner. So this slide is um, actually just going to kind of go through and then we'll go on to the next slide. So as you can see, again, the uh, microbe is being engulfed and killed by the neutrophil. I think the mission of really Novo Bay is to tap into the power of neutrophils and um, be able to really address um, prudent use of antibiotics uh, when we absolutely need it, and really reserve our antibiotics for patients that really need it. So here I have a picture of one of my patients that actually on the left side of the screen, you have a picture of the eyelids and lashes with 
some debris around the lashes. And then on the right side, the patient is actually um, used the eyelid cleanser uh, twice a day for two weeks. And, um, you know, the, you don't really see the debris and you don't see the sleeves around the lashes. The eyelid cleanser, Novo the eyelid cleanser, the eye actually stands for intelligent. Uh, so this is really more of an intelligent design and um, really working more intelligently as opposed to just kind of prescribing antibiotics with a sort of a genie, uh, knee reaction. Uh, so this is another patient. This was actually a very interesting uh, woman who had been uh, sort of struggling with uh, blepharitis. And I had prescribed on at least two different occasions antibiotics. And um, she came to me, and she was about to go on a trip. And I said, you know, it looks like you have another case of blepharitis. If you can see on the left side, you can actually see debris around the lashes. The eyelid is erythematous, the telangiectatic vessels on the uh, tarsal margin. And I, I told her, you know, I can certainly give you another course of antibiotics. Um, or you can use the eyelid cleanser, cleanse your lids and lashes um, twice a day for 10 days, and then we can see how you do. And certainly if you need the antibiotic, I'll be happy to prescribe it, or we could do a combination. And she said, you know what, let me just try the eyelid cleanser. Let me see how this goes. Um, and so she actually did it, and she was very pleased. Uh, she came back after 10 days. Her eyelids looked fabulous. The, the debris was gone, the swelling was uh, reduced, and she was very, very comfortable. And so we, we were able to really, in her case, not even need um, the antibiotics again. Um, I think one of the other uh, really uh, features of um, Nova Bay Eyelid Cleanser uh, with hypochlorous acid as preservatives is that we have excellent activity against a broad range of pathogens. And these are based on our laboratory testing, where we've shown reduction of 99.99% of .99 in many of the bacteria that we're interested in, such as Staph aureus, Staph epi, MRSA. And these are really time kills of 60 seconds, uh, or and some, some of the bacteria even less than that. So we have a very effective um, we have effective, we are essentially effective against the, the type of pathogens that we commonly see around lids and lashes. This is another time kill uh, kinetics of our product, Novo Bay Eyelid Cleanser, and we've, com we've compared it to one of our uh, competitor uh, lid cleanser formulations. And um, uh, on the um, top, you see the two lines, um, actually the 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 blue and the purple uh, is actually Ocusoft and Ocusoft Plus. And then the, on the bottom, you'll see the, um, our hypochlorous acid solution, which shows a dramatic reduction in the uh, colony forming units of MRSA within a minute, uh, whereas the other product actually takes 30 minutes for the um, product to be effective. Uh, and also, we've compared our, um, in terms of toxicity, to uh, Betadine, for instance. And Betadine is a wonderful uh, surgical scrub. I use it every time I do surgery. I think, um, and most surgeons do, and I think that's fine. However, if it gets into the eye or if a patient, or if for some reason, um, you know, it's not irrigated out, it can be very, very toxic. And uh, when we actually compare the toxicity index of um, our product to Betadine, you know, we're a thousand times uh, safer. And uh, in terms of the forward log reduction and time kill, uh, we're actually very effective in less than a minute. We see the kind of reduction in uh, our staph uh, aureus um, than it would take betadine at, at non-toxic levels to reach uh, in 24 hours. And I think it's, just, it's important to point out what really biofilm um, is and what biofilm does. In many chronic infections and chronic wounds, um, we have kind of nooks and crannies where bacteria live, and they are very happy kind of just hiding uh, in those areas. And, and in my belief, um, you know, the eye, eyeball surface, you know, is not a good biofilm. Um, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of biofilm, let's say, on the surface of the cornea or conjunctiva, but when it gets to the actual eyelids and lashes, we have lots of places where bacteria can hide, and I think we have a, 
a perfect place for biofilm to grow. Um, eyelid cleanser in our, um, I think I skipped a slide, here we go. Uh, eyelid cleanser uh, in, in our laboratory testing has been shown to disrupt biofilm. And on the left side, we have actually saline as our control. And on the right side, we have the Nova Bay eyelid cleanser um, treated um, bacteria. And you can see the clumping that you see on the right-hand side indicates disruption of biofilm and, uh, and obviously uh, death of the bacteria. We also have another example of, again, I, uh, disruption of biofilm with uh, eyelid cleanser. On the left-hand side, we have a um, picture of saline, again, as the control with pseudomonas. And as you can see, there's like a glob of um, material and not the biofilm. On the right-hand side, you can see a dispersion of that blob and that's um, disruption of the biofilm. So let's just get back to kind of the neutrophil, um, uh, properties of neutrophil and what hypochlorous acid uh, it can, can do. So we talked about the fact that it's released from neutrophils. It's part of our body's immune response, and therefore it's quite safe. Um, and we know that it's very effective against killing microorganisms. But in some of our laboratory studies, and specifically with our work with um, necrotizing fasciitis and flesh-eating bacteria, where lots of toxins are produced and, and inflammatory mediators are released, we're actually, we can, we, we've done uh, testing to see um, how hypochlorous acid can mitigate the inflammatory response. And we've been able to show that it actually inactivates um, some of the toxins that are produced by the bacteria. It neutralizes, for instance, the alpha hemolysin that's um, produced by um, bacteria. And here we have a, a sort of a cartoon representing the bacteria toxins that are produced and how it can um, affect the um, cells. And as a result of the response to the toxin, uh, human cells secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and, um, and inflammatory uh, sort of uh, chemicals that if they're not stopped uh, could potentially uh, cause a lot of damage. So it's not just the bacteria that's causing damage, but rather all the um, inflammatory response is generated as a result of responding to the toxin. So if we have a product that actually can uh, remove the bacteria or kill the bacteria, potentially can also block the toxins, I think we can get ahead of this inflammatory cascade and stop it. And I think we'd be uh, more effective than just prescribing, uh, for instance, a, a, an antibiotic. I'd like to also share with you um, a sort of a product comparison of ingredients. Um, I think it's, the slide is kind of too small for you to read the ingredients. But really the point is just to see that Nova Bay Eyelid Cleanser has really two ingredients. We have saline and hypochlorous acid as our preservative. And if you look at all the other products, you see a number of um, you know, 30 different ingredients. Many of them are uh, soaps and detergents and um, surfactants. And if you, if, if you have a patient that actually follows the instructions on some of the other products and they leave it on their skin for the number of minutes that they're supposed to, um, you may see allergic reaction. You may see actually allergic dermatitis, and it's been reported uh, that actually about 10% of patients develop some kind of an allergic reaction to some of the chemicals in those products. So it's not um, out of uh, sort of, you know, I, I, can, I have to tell you that, you know, as a neurotic surgeon, I have had patients use uh, many of these scrubs before cataract surgery. And I have to actually cancel a couple of cases because patients called and said, my, you know, their eyes are red and irritated. And, and sure enough, you know, I look at their eyes and they're very irritated. And, and so we, you know, had to cancel surgery uh, just because I didn't want to take a patient that was having an allergic uh, reaction um, prior to cataract surgery. So it is important to be mindful of what we're prescribing and uh, it is certainly, I think, as surgeons, 
Uh, we are also very mindful of reducing the bacterial load. Many other um, elective surgeries, I know patients are being given chlorhexidine as a, as a scrub you know, before surgery, before the patient even goes to the hospital. However, you know, chlorhexidine is not safe to use around the eyes. So I think here we may have a potential a product that, that could be used um, to help clean the lids and lashes. Uh, and um, have better outcome um, after surgery or after any procedure. I'd just like to share this um, uh, sort of a, a lesson that um, we perhaps have not learned yet as, an, as a uh, medical community, and that's the lesson that was shared um, by Sir Alexander Fleming that the microbes are educated to resist penicillin and a host of penicillin fast organisms is bred out. In such cases, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin is morally responsible for the death of men who finally succumbs to infection with the penicillin-resistant organism. I hope this evil can be averted. So this was a quote on, in New York Times uh, from 1945 I think we're still dealing with the same issue. Uh, I really want to promote judicious use of antibiotics, and I think the mission of Nova Bay uh, Pharmaceutical Company is also uh, sort of in line with that, and I'm very, very uh, appreciative that they've been supportive of creating this um, product where potentially we can have patients use uh, a, a product that's safe to use around their, their lids and lashes, and is not necessarily an antibiotic. Um, thank you, and I will um, get the podium back to you, Glenn. Great, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Art, for a very informative uh, presentation. We do have some questions from the audience, and the first one is gonna be uh, aimed at Art, and the question is, do you see eyelid cleanser being used in conjunction with other products like Blefex and Mybomian gland pump and laser heat probe devices. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Glenn. And uh, that's actually a very, very good question. I actually, before I answer, I just want to comment, Katie. I really enjoyed that, and uh, particularly that last slide of Fleming. That's uh, very similar to a number of slides I've used, and uh, uh, issues with antibiotic resistance have uh, actually. Uh, uh, been a focus of mine for quite some time, so we're very much aligned. Uh, to answer the, the question, uh, actually, my bomian gland dysfunction is a major uh, a major issue in our office, and in fact, we uh, have a lipoflow, which I believe uh, you're referring to as a my bomian gland pump, uh, and we've had it for you know almost uh, as long as our office has been open. So uh, you know, a large percentage of the patients I see actually are dry eye patients. In, in fact, that that this point, uh, I would say it's probably two-thirds of the patients I see are specifically uh, uh, coming for uh, dry eye therapy. And I do use eyelid cleanser. Uh, I, use, uh, I use it for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, I alluded to before that staff uh, overpopulate the lids in these patients, particularly in the geriatric population. The older population, uh, in my opinion, has significant staff overpopulation. Uh, even beyond what you'd expect in, in, a, in a more typical, um, more evenly distributed uh, age range population. And uh, because staph can uh, produce a significant amount of morbidity, uh, saponification, that soap making issue where there's a, a, a lot of uh, burning and patient uh, symptomology, uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why I like using eyelid cleanser to reduce the staph overpopulation without adding a soap. And that's uh, you know something Katie alluded to. Uh, a lot of the products on the market today actually are detergents. And uh, work by Hank Perry a number of years ago was, you know, uh, I think very formative in my thinking. You don't want to uh, add soap uh, or detergent when the staff are actually already producing a fair amount because you're just drying out the skin and uh, making the patient even less comfortable. Uh, and also with the exotoxin issue that, uh, that both of us spoke about, so you want to reduce that population. Uh, we don't have a BLEFX yet. That's something that we're uh, considering, but I do manual lid debridement. 
Uh, and again, uh, I think Lightweight Glasser is a perfect uh, adjunct for that as well. So what I like about it is it reduces uh, overpopulation and addresses uh, the flora uh, and minimizes a lot of the complications associated with uh, MGD that are inflammatory in nature, uh, in addition to the other issues that uh, plague these patients, like evaporative dry eye and unstable tear film uh, and insufficient lipid. So uh, I think it has tremendous utility there. Glenn, back to you. Thanks, Art. Katie, this question is for you. How does this product figure in the treatment of demodex blepharitis and ocular rosacea? Thank you, Glenn, for that question. It's an excellent question. And I know that there's been uh, quite a bit of interest in uh, demodex as a potential uh, cause of blepharal conjunctivitis. And certainly I think there is... Um, uh, you know, perhaps significant number of patients that have it. I personally have not seen uh, patients with demodex-related blepharitis, at least the ones that have plucked their lashes and looked under the microscope. Um, however, just to answer the question as to whether this product could be effective, uh, you know, it may be, and we're actually looking at doing in vitro uh, studies or uh, perhaps even, uh, you know, additional studies to look to see um, hypochlorous acid saline would be effective. Theoretically, it would be, you know, because uh, I think uh, the demodex would be very sensitive um, to um, hypochlorous acid. So theoretically, I think it would be very effective. Uh, your second question about um, rosacea. Um, you know, with rosacea, I think there's a, a certainly an, um, uh, perhaps an autoimmune or inflammatory component and patients um, could have uh, a combination of uh, blepharitis and rosacea. And I think even my bony and gland dysfunction is seen with rosacea. Uh, I think it's very difficult to treat those patients. Uh, in my practice, I have um, a few patients with rosacea, uh, blepharitis, and I have been prescribing uh, and recommending use of violet cleanser uh, to these patients, and from time to time, I've also had to give them uh, steroids uh, or a combination of the two where I've, I've given them eyelid cleanser as well as uh, topical uh, steroid drops or ointments. Very good. Thanks, Katie. Katie, another question for you. Uh, one of our listeners asked, are you recommending eliminating uh, betadine and replacing it with eyelid cleanser, or are you seeing the two used together, and if so, how? Okay, uh, that's an excellent question. I'm glad that you asked this. Absolutely, uh, I do not recommend that you eliminate betadine. I think, uh, as I said, it's a, a wonderful surgical prep. I use it on every single cataract or glaucoma surgery that I do. Um, I think this, the, the way I use it in my practice is that I have my patients, and even before um, we had the, the Novo Bay Eyelid Cleanser, I actually had my patients use um, whatever over-the-counter um, scrubs that were available. And, and really the idea is the cleaner the lids and lashes, the fewer the bacteria on the skin, the less likely that you would get the bacteria in the eye during surgery. And as Art um, eloquently um, showed in the slides and also with Dr. Speaker's um, uh, research, you know, the bacteria that generally is found in endophthalmitis cases is also the same bacteria that we find on the skin. So, again, being the neurotic surgeon that I am, um, you know, I want to make sure that my patient's eyelids are as clean as possible before I take them to surgery. So my routine is I have my patients, actually my female patients, to stop using makeup products on their eyelids for three days before. I have them actually use the eyelid cleanser twice a day for about five days and have them just clean their lids and lashes um, before surgery. And then on the day of surgery, I use Betadine. I actually use Betadine 10% on the skin and then I use the ophthalmic grade, grade Betadine, which is 5% as an eye drop uh, right you know, to, to sort of put in a couple of drops uh, in the conjunctival cul-de-sac um, and then, you know, wait a few minutes and then irrigate it out of the conjunctiva. 
Very good. Thanks for that answer, Katie. Very thorough. Katie, another question for you. Uh, with your patients, have you experienced any hypersensitivity with eyelid cleanser? Uh, um, that again, excellent question. I have not. I have not seen hypersensitivity uh, to eyelid cleansers. The number one comment I get from patients after they have used the product for a couple of weeks and they come back is that they feel re refreshed. They come back and say, "Doctor, this was so refreshing to use this product." So. Um, I have not seen any sensitive, you know, sensitivity. I haven't, I haven't seen any redness. Uh, none of my patients have complained of any stinging or irritation um, from from this product. Very good, very good. Thanks, Katie. And the last question I'm going to handle. Uh, one of the listeners has asked, "How do I get this product for my patients?" That's, I think that's a really good question. Um, our product is available only to the professional, uh, so you're able to order it into your practices and sell it on to your patients. And if you look at the last slide, you can see uh, there's a number of ways to do it. You can call directly. There's a number to call directly. There's also an email, uh, so sales at eyelid cleanser. If you send an email there, someone will get back to you. Okay, we also have a website now called www.eyelidcleanseronword.com. So there are several ways to call and inquire about the product, and uh, we can set you up with that product so you can start uh, giving the benefits to your patients. So I think we've answered all of the questions right now, and I think the last thing I, we would like to do is to thank you for your participation this evening, and we're going to share with you a video uh, of, of Dr. Uh, Katie and her, a couple of her patients that have had great success with this product. So with that, we're going to uh, show you this video. <laughs> 